Hello there, Emperor Claudius. Listen to me. You think you're a big man with your tin plated men, with your little frilly little plumies on top. Fiddling with the kids, we know what you Romans get up to. The old boy Caesar, he put a good, he put a couple of good ones in, I tell you that, I'll give him that. But you won't, you won't, if man and unless you cross that ocean and come here to fight a gale, it'll be the last thing you do, boy. I'll put you in the underworld, I'll send you down there. May Terranius strike me down if I tell a lie! You dirty Italian weasel, yeah! You can't fight! None of you can fight! You come here and fight me like a man! A guy will fight you like a man! With his own hands, that's what he do, boy! I'll smash you in with these two hands, I will! Do cross that ocean! My cousin, Finn, he'll blow the Kalnix! And that'll be the last noise you hear, I don't mind telling you! Then I'll come out to you with me fists! And I'll send you to the underworld, boy! <laughs> The Celts are usually associated with the British Arts, and with bagpipes, tartan, ginger hair, and myths about fairies and monsters. From classical times right into the early modern era, it was believed that they were the original indigenous peoples of Europe, although the ancient Celts themselves never made that claim. More so than any other ethnic group in Europe, the truth of the Celts through a combination of their mystical folklore, the popularity of Romanticism in Britain in the 19th century, and the need among regional nationalists to define themselves in opposition to the dominant culture of Britain, has been grossly distorted. The author of Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien, wrote, Celtic is a magic bag into which anything may be put and out of which almost anything may come. Anything is possible in the fabulous Celtic twilight, which is not so much a twilight of the gods as of the reason. The problem stems in large part from the fact that Celt sometimes refers to indigenous Northwest Europeans, who formerly spoke or do now speak insular Celtic languages, while also referring to an historical ethno-linguistic culture on the continent which encompassed many diverse peoples. Sometimes people get these two things confused. Modern genetic science has proven that the Celtic language speakers were not a prehistoric people, nor were they a homogenous racial group. Rather, Celtic culture originated in Central Europe, where its language and art spread out over the Iron Age and was adopted by diverse races from Anatolia to Ireland. Even the insular Celts of Britain and Ireland do not constitute a homogenous genetic group, which makes sense historically since the insular Celtic nations were constantly at war with each other. For example, the Irish took Cornish slaves and invaded Scotland. The old dichotomy of Germanic versus Celtic blood doesn't make much sense when you consider that the land now known as Germany was in fact a heartland for Celtic culture long before it arrived in Britain. What most people call Celtic blood is really British and Irish blood, and if we are to speak of Germanic blood, it ought really to refer to Nordic, not German, since Germanic languages come from Denmark when Germany was largely Celtic. Confused yet? Archaeologists of the 19th century figured out that Austria had the oldest identifiably Celtic types of art, and subsequent discoveries have proven that Austria, Switzerland, Czechia and Germany were the oldest homelands of the Celts. But where did they come from? The dominant regional culture of the Bronze Age was the Unitica culture, an Indo-European culture with barrow graves which grew powerful due to the rich copper and salt mines of the region. A complicated process of cultural fusion occurred there with the Eastern Belbica culture, which was also Indo-European. By the Middle Bronze Age, the Unitica culture was followed by the Tumulus culture, which preserved the ancient Indo-European tradition of burial mounds and probably spoke a language ancestral to both Celtic and Latin. This, in turn, was replaced in the Late Bronze Age by the Urnfield culture, in which burials in barrows went out of fashion and people started burning their dead and putting them in urns, a tradition which may derive from surviving pre-Indo-European rites like those among the Romanian Cucuteni Tripilia culture. It is likely that people in the Urnfield culture were still culturally Indo-European in most respects and that they spoke 
Proto-Celtic, the first truly Celtic language. This in turn developed into the Hallstatt culture over the Iron Age, which itself becomes the Latin culture, named after a site in Switzerland where thousands of objects had been deposited in the lake, presumably in a ritual fashion, as was the custom for Celts in Britain also. While Hallstatt material culture still resembles earlier Bronze Age art, the Latin style of art is clearly the basis for later art of the Iron Age Celts in Gaul and Britain. The narrative I have just presented is not new, but has often been contested, with some even claiming a British origin for the Celts. However, with recent advances in genetic science in the last 10 years, we no longer have to rely on the vague suggestions of art and haplogroups, but can look at genome-wide analysis of ancient DNA from Celtic skeletons. Although a thorough new study on the spread of the Celtic people in Europe hasn't been done yet. The DNA from Iron Age and Bronze Age Britons has been made public, and we can see there is a shift over time caused by approximately 10% admixture from a Central European source related to Hallstatt people. The two black stars on this PCA chart represent two skeletons from the Hallstatt culture and it can clearly be seen that one plots among modern Dutch people and one among modern northern French people, but neither plots among modern British Celtic areas. However, the purple Iron Age British Celts on the chart are between the older Bronze Age British samples and the Hallstatt samples, indicating there was an invasion of continental Celts to Britain who were related to these Hallstatt samples, and that these people changed the DNA of Britain and Ireland. Furthermore, a 2018 paper by Damgard and colleagues titled The First Horse Herders and the Impact of Early Bronze Age Steppe Expansions into Asia, which wasn't about Celts at all, included a lot of ancient DNA samples, one of which, labelled MA2197, came from Iron Age Anatolia during the Hellenistic period. Now, MA2197 appears to be a mixed individual, with half of his ancestry coming from local Greco-Anatolian stock, and the other half from an invading Central European person, like the Celtic-speaking Hallstatt people in Czechia. That is not at all shocking if you know that there were Celts in Anatolia at that time called Galatians. The ninth book of the New Testament of the Christian Bible is addressed specifically to the Galatians, some of whom had already converted to Christianity within living memory of the death of Christ, and who St. Paul said should not observe the Jewish customs such as circumcision that Christians had formerly observed. The first Galatians entered Anatolia via Thrace in 278 BC, led by Leotarios and Leonorios. They remained pagan for over 300 years there, worshipping Celtic gods alongside Greek ones, and mingling with Hellenic and Luwian peoples of Anatolia over the Iron Age. However, if Celts had originated in Britain, then we would see British DNA coming into the region, but we don't. We see Hallstatt-related DNA, thus reinforcing the theory that Central Europe, not Britain, is the original Celtic homeland. Celtic culture did not expand as an empire like that of the Romans. There was no centralised government or Celtic capital city. Rather, many regional Indo-European tribes traded with the wealthy Celts of Central Europe, intermarried with them, and adopted their language and aspects of their culture, such as their art and their gods. But why was their culture so popular? Their success must be partly due to their military and technological prowess. Celtic developments in metalworking were highly advanced for their time, and it is telling that the Proto-Germanic word for iron, Isena, is actually a loanword from Proto-Celtic, Isernon, meaning bloody and red. 
even the supposedly more advanced cultures of the Mediterranean learned from the Celts. The Etruscans, and then the Romans, learned about advanced weaponry from the Celts who invaded Italy. Dr. P.F. Stari says their weapons, helmets, shields and tactics owed much to the Celtic innovations, emphasising that Celtic weapons were a major influence on the Etruscan and Roman military systems. The Celts brought the iron knob helmet with a round cap and neck and cheek guards to Italy where Etruscans and Romans copied it. The Celts also originally had larger and better shields than the Romans, who first used small shields. Diodorus Siculus wrote, They have man-sized shields, decorated in a manner peculiar to them. Some of these have projecting figures in bronze skillfully wrought, not only for decoration but for protection. The Romans copied these and started to make larger shields, called in Latin scutum, which may also be a Celtic loanword from the same root which gives us the Irish word Skiath, meaning both shield and shoulder. The Roman word for a light spear, lancia, which is related to the English word lance, is also of Celtic origin, as is materis, which means pike. While chariots of war had fallen out of use in most parts of the world by the Iron Age, the Celts had preserved this Bronze Age technology and upgraded it. They invented iron rims for the wheels, the Latin word for a travelling cart, covincarius, comes from a Celtic word for war chariot, covinus. Caesar related how the British used chariots to great effect against his legions, and archaeology shows they were also in use among the Irish. This oak statue of a Celtic warrior was found in the harbour of Geneva Lake in 1898. It belongs to the Latin culture and wears a tunic. It was dated by means of three Celtic silver coins of the second century BC, which were in a fissure in the statue, and is thought to depict a Celtic deity who may have been associated with Lake Geneva. The museum emphasizes the association with human sacrifice. Like all Indo-European pagans, the Celts believed in many gods. Like Hindus, Celts believed in dual and triune deities, and these are sometimes represented in the idols. For example, this stone head from Wiltshire has two faces. Much like this dual-headed god, which is from the Celtic sanctuary of Rochebertus in France, and is dated to the 3rd century BC. This Celtic sword from 60 BC has been beautifully decorated with a face, perhaps of a warrior or a god. We will never know, but such faces are a common feature of Celtic art. Gold was also important. As Diodorus Siculus relates, they amass a great amount of gold, which is used for ornament not only by the women, but also by the men. For around their wrists and arms they wear bracelets, Around their necks, heavy necklaces of solid gold, and huge rings they wear as well, and even corslets of gold. And a peculiar and striking practice is found among the upper Celts, in connection with the sacred precincts of the gods, as for in the temples and precincts made consecrate in their land, a great amount of gold has been deposited as a dedication to the gods, and not a native of the country ever touches it because of religious scruple although the Celts are an exceedingly covetous people. This 1st century BC bucket is one of the best examples of Celtic art from Britain. Large buckets like this one were used for serving beverages at feasting occasions. The elaborate decorations of mythical animals and human heads distinguish it from your everyday buckets and mark it as a symbol of status and power. Discovered in 1807, in a Celtic cremation burial at St Margaret's Mead near Marlborough, these kinds of buckets start to appear in Britain at the same time as Gallo-Belgic coinage in the 2nd century before Christ, indicating an increased cultural connection to the continental Celt at that time.
This cauldron was found in Denmark, but can clearly be identified as Celtic by the art style. It was most likely made by Celts in the Balkans, then traded with more northerly Celts, from whom it was stolen or traded with Teutons who took it home to Denmark. Druidic beliefs in reincarnation seem to be depicted in one scene in which a large godlike figure is dipping the fallen warriors into the cauldron of life and restoring them to live and fight again. Julius Caesar recorded that the Druids of Gaul, Britain and Ireland had metempsychosis as one of their core doctrines. The principal point of their doctrine is that the soul does not die and that after death it passes from one body into another. The main object of all education is, in their opinion, to imbue their scholars with a firm belief in the indestructibility of the human soul, which according to their belief, merely passes a death from one tenement to another. For by such doctrine alone, they say, which robs death of all its terrors, can the highest form of human courage be developed. Diodorus Siculus also relates the importance of the Druidic, or philosopher caste, among the Gauls. He says the Druids could divine the future by observing the flights of birds and the behaviour of sacrificial animals and humans. No Gaul could make war or sacrifice without first consulting a Druid. Caesar wrote that the Gauls adopted the practice of Druidry from Britain, where the main centre of Druidic learning was situated. We know that Druidry was also prevalent in Ireland, even as recently as the medieval era, where they are recorded as diviners. This begs the question of whether Druidry itself was not really a pan-Celtic cultural practice, but one specific to the British Isles, and therefore possibly pre-Celtic in origin, an Indo-European priestly caste native to Britain and Ireland. My name is Tom Rousel. Thank you for watching this short introduction to the Celts. Please click subscribe and take a look at some of the other videos and history films on my channel covering Anglo-Saxons, Vikings, Romans and more. You can also get access to exclusive live streams if you become a patron on patreon.com or Subscribestar. Also, did you know I have a storybook for sale?